I want to remind you that the uh, offerings can be given through the website at gmvumc.org, uh, and there's also a box back here you can give offerings if you'd like to. Thank you for your tithes and offerings and for your faithfulness. Let me make a few announcements. Next Sunday is graduation Sunday when we'll be recognizing our graduates. And also next Sunday is our meeting at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary, a very important meeting and administrative board council vote. So everybody keep that in mind. Uh, also, did you know that we got a church picnic coming up? May 25th at Cornerstone. So I hope that all the church family, we tried to schedule that earlier in the year this year so it wouldn't be so hot. Uh, so uh, we're going to be out there. There's a special presentation that's going to happen out there. At the, We've got three kids' days on Wednesdays through the month of May, so y'all look for those. Okay, Out here on the desk are some uh, little gifts for mothers. Be sure to pick one up. Also, there's a backdrop out there if you want to take some photographs of the family. Take advantage of the backdrop, okay? Or go outside by the fountain or wherever you want to go. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. What did I say? 25th. Well, I wrote 25th. The picnic's the 23rd, <laughs> which is a Saturday. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. All right, let us pray. We're also going to bless the offering at this time, but let's pray and we'll worship. Father, we honor you. We thank you. We give you praise and glory for being our, our wonderful, uh, precious, loving Father. And God, we just honor you this morning with our tithes and our offerings. Will you pray your blessings upon those? We thank you, God, that we can come into your house with worship, with praise. Uh, Lord, we pray that everything we say, everything we do, and every action is pleasing in your sight. Because, God, we want to honor you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
Fingers in shape at the sound of Jesus' name Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name
talk to each other, and then your cue to come back is you'll hear us start singing. that ancient cross how precious is my Savior's blood the beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame the image of love upon death's way My heart was worth the pain. Joy could you see behind the pain? Love found my soul would die. How wonderful, how glorious my sin. freedom. When I see that grave, I'll see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise. And that's what I'd like for us to do right now, is to just sing his praise, because he is so worthy. He is so worthy. And let's just, let's just sing it together. And let's just lift it up to the heavens. And let's just give him all the honor and all the praise. I 
see that cross, I see freedom. I see that grave, I see Jesus. From death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your face. I see that cross, I see freedom. And I see that grave, I see Jesus. From death.
You may be seated. Amen. Happy Mother's Day to all the hot messes out there. Amen. <laughs> I want to thank the church. Uh, I've missed you guys. I've been out for the last couple of weeks. Um, two Sundays ago, my uh, two Sundays ago, um, around seven thirty, uh, my dad split the gates of heaven, and. Uh, Yes, I'm still grieving. Uh, I'm going to do that for a while because he wasn't just daddy. He was also my best friend. So, And remember, Mom, you know, 65 years is a long time to live with somebody, no matter how aggravated you get at one another. 65 years is a long time to live with somebody, and then you're not there anymore, you know. But I want to thank the church. You have been so kind. You have uh, sent messages, and I'm still getting cards through the mail. That's just because post office is slow right now. <laughs> but thank you for all that and for the visits. Some of you came to visitation, and, and some of you brought food, and there's just been a great outpouring of love. So uh, we feel very loved, so thank you for that. <clears throat> This is, not a, this is not a Mother's Day sermon this morning, but uh, about every other Mother's Day, I preach a Mother's Day sermon, and uh, because it usually falls in the season of Easter, I like to stick with the Easter season, uh, as we, especially as we're leading up to Pentecost Sunday and the coming of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> there have been so many people in my life who have been mothers to me, especially when you're a young preacher. Now, when I was a young preacher, Lord have mercy, I had so many mamas in the church, Right, uh, and they wanted me to—they wanted me to dress well, <laughs> and they wanted me to eat well, and you know they—they they wanted to take care of me. And I'm just so so appreciative for all of the people in the church that have been mothers, and some of those mothers were not mothers biologically; they didn't have children of their own, but they were spiritual mothers, you know. And so on this day, I always think about that mother that always wanted to have children but never could. Uh, mothers who have adopted children, mothers who are, foster, who are foster mothers to other children, mothers who are, who are spiritual mothers. So I always want to be sensitive, think about all those people that always wanted to have a biological child of their own, but, but they never could. But they're still mothers, amen? They're still mothers in their own unique way. As we approach Pentecost, which is coming up very quickly, uh, in uh, in next couple of Sundays, I want I started thinking uh, uh, about uh, the church. A lot of times we think Pentecost over there in Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit fell on the church, that is the birth of the New Testament church. But it's not the birth of the Old Testament church. Amen. It goes all. Everybody say Amen. You'll feel better. It goes all the way back to Genesis. I want, to, I want to mention, a, a, so we're going to read from Genesis chapter 28. If you've been in Sunday school for a few years, you know these scriptures. And we'll go back and talk about it a little bit later. This is from the life of Jacob. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. That's like saying I'm leaving Gardendale 
and I'm going to Thunder Bay, Ontario, on the other side of Lake Superior. This is not a short journey. <laughs> when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night. He was about, only about 40 miles in, okay? He stopped for the night because the sun had set, and taking one of the stones, <clears throat> put it under his head, and he lay down to sleep. And he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth. Some versions of the Bible say a ladder, okay? A ladder on the earth with its top reaching heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on the ladder. Now, if you know Jacob and you know the story of Jacob, think about this rascal, okay? That is having this experience with God. There's, there's actually an, an African-American spiritual that says, We are climbing Jacob's ladder, children of the Lord. Y'all remember that song? Y'all know that song? <clears throat> there above the ladder stood the Lord, and he said, I am, everybody say, I am. Moses knew those words well, right? I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, and I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west, everybody say west, to the east, north, and south. All people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am, everybody say I am, with you. And I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. And when Jacob awoke from the sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. We've even got a hymn in the hymnal. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. That's where it comes from, right? Right out of the scripture. And I was not aware of it. I know now... <laughs> But when I lay down here last night on this long journey, I didn't know this was the place for the Lord, but I, I know it now. Have you ever just gotten to a place in your life when things got so tough and things got so bad and, and things were chasing you? I want you to remember his brother Esau. We'll get to that in a little bit. That you just had to stop and lay down and suddenly have a realization, God is in this place. Things are tough right now, but God is in this place. He was afraid. I'd be afraid too, wouldn't you? And he said, how awesome, how awesome is this place. This is none other than, everybody say it, the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it and he called that place Bethel or Bethel, which means house of God. El means God, Beth means, means house. He called it the house of God. Anytime you see a church, how many churches have you ever seen named Bethel or Mount Bethel? There's a bunch of them. Because that name means house, everybody say it, house of God. Though the city used to be called Luz. Now Moses is saying, looking back on this event in retrospect, as he writes Genesis, Moses is reflecting on this and saying, yeah, we call it Bethel now, and we know it is Bethel, but it wasn't always called that. At one time it was called Luz. And I'll tell you what Luz means in a little bit. And then Jacob made a vow. Everybody say he made a vow. And he said, if God will be with me and I watch over me on this journey and give me food to eat and clothes to wear. How many of you got food to eat and clothes to wear? So that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up Jacob set up the first altar unto God. Will be a pillar and will be God's house. And listen to this, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. 
Yeah, you knew I was going to get around to tithing somewhere. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. The Word of God for the people of God. And this is my first point. The house of God is a connection. Jacob didn't realize that this place, and, and Luz means separation. Did you know that? It means separation because Luz was located at a crossroads. North, south, east, and west travel journeys intersected right there at Luz, and this is where people often separated on their journey. Luz literally means separation. But when Jacob is there and he, and he gets a rock for his pillow and he lays down and he goes to sleep and he has a dream and he sees the stairway between heaven and earth and the angels of God descending and ascending on it, what he is witnessing is a connection between earth and heaven. And so he renamed it. He said, no, this is not a place of separation. As a matter of fact, when you reach a crossroads in your life, that is a, that is a moment of decision. It is not a moment of separation. And he said, this is none other than the house of God because the angels are ascending and descending right here in this place. And we never think about church that way, do we? Or we often forget or we get caught up on other things that are not so important. And we forget that this is a connection between earth and heaven, the house of God. And let's talk about who our connection is. If you remember the story from John chapter 1, Jesus is going around and calling his disciples. And Philip goes and tells his brother Nathaniel, he says, you need to come and meet this man who says he is the Messiah. You need to come and meet him. And this is what happens in John chapter 1. Jesus, uh, he, he goes up to Nathaniel and he says, I see that you are an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He said, you're not putting on a front. You are who you are. You're earnest, you're honest, you're prayerful. I can see your nature. And Nathaniel said, and then Jesus said to him, I saw you under the fig tree. I don't know what was going on with Nathaniel under the fig tree. Maybe he was praying. Maybe he was connecting to God. Maybe, you know, maybe he, there was something there that Jesus witnessed. And because Jesus said that to Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree, it said that Nathaniel believed that he was the Messiah. And this is what Jesus said. And this is my interpretation. If you believe because I saw you under the fig tree, you ain't seen nothing yet. I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Verily, verily, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Nathaniel, being a boy who was a good Jewish boy raised in the synagogue, knew the story of Jacob, and he knew the story of Jacob's ladder, where it said the angels of God were ascending and descending on the ladder. And he said, Oh my goodness, Jesus just told me that he is the connection between heaven and earth. Jesus just told me that he is Jacob's ladder. Jesus just filled in the blanks for me on that old story that Moses told so many years ago that the connection between heaven and earth is in the person of Jesus Christ. So the house of God is a connection. And here's my second point. And I might as well do like Tyler and warn you, there's only three. Amen. I think he had two that day. <laughs> the house of God is a conversation. Jacob spoke to God and God spoke to Jacob. Now let's look at this. Now here we are at Luz, okay? Do y'all like my artwork? <laughs> I did this on the computer. I really wanted a whiteboard up there, and y'all wouldn't be able to read it. So. so there's north, south, east, and west. You've got the compass up there. And that little stick, man, that's, that is the uh, international sign for slow down. No, it's not. <laughs> and we see the family coming down to a crossroads, right? The cow and the chicken is just to let you know that's a rural area, okay? That's, that's all that's about. Okay, and if you, if you look to the east, what do you see? There's a big event, right? There's a big event. There's a big event. And so the family's coming into town, 
And, and the little stick man that's there waving, right? He's a resident of the town. And so he's trying to, he's trying to have a conversation with everybody that visits the crossroad, okay? Let's go to the, to the next slide. So let's look at this. There's three parts to conversation. The first part to conversation is conversation is a correction. Now let's imagine that this family that drove into town and they're pretty red convertible, let's, let, let, let's pretend they turned east. I mean, wait a minute, I'm, I'm backwards. West, right? Where's the big event? It's over there. But let's say they turn and they, and they go the wrong way. And this guy's running behind them. Wait, whoa, wait. Are y'all trying to get to the big event? Yes. You're going the wrong way. You're going in the wrong direction. One of the conversations that we're supposed to have in the house of God is a conversation of correction. If somebody is going in the wrong direction, somebody needs to say, whoa, you're going to miss the big event. But the scenery is great in this direction. I like this direction. We saw some cows and chickens in this direction. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to miss the big event. Go, go the other way. So part of the conversation that God had to have with Jacob was a conversation of correction. And we'll get into that in just a little bit too. Because Jacob had royally messed up in his life. Do, do you ever feel like at times that you are just royally messing it up? Your relationship with God, your relationship with your family, the relationship with the people that you work with. You're just messing things up because you won't accept correction. The house of God is a place for correction. Let's go to the next conversation. Next slide. It's also B. There it is, B. It's also part of the conversation is d direction, and it's different. Let's say the, the family in the convertibles be bopping down through there from north to south, and everybody's on their cell phones like the people in Gardendale Drive. Everybody's on their cell phone, even the person behind the wheel. I've started blowing my horn at people that I see on the cell phone. So they'll go. So they'll look up. Amen. Because the world's coming at you at 60 miles an hour, right? <laughs> so they're all looking at their cell phone trying to pull up the GPS. But this is a rural area. There's no service. Nobody carries an atlas anymore. Y'all remember the days of the travel atlas that you had with you when you went on a long trip? I probably still got one of those somewhere. <laughs> but it's wrong. <laughs> the roads have changed. The roads have changed. And so the, the, the guy that's the local, he's going, hey, I see y'all all on your cell phone. Are y'all trying to go to the, to the big event? Yes, we're trying to make it to the big event. He says, turn east. So he gives them the right directions, right? So it's not only a correction. The conversation is not just a correction. It, it's a giving the correct directions. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something. In America today, the church has given people some wrong directions. We got to give people the right directions, amen, because we're trying to get to the big event, right? So part of that conversation is direction. And here's the third part of the conversation, inspiration. That is C, the C of number two. That should be number two. I think I messed that up. Autocorrect. Inspiration. Let's see. Let's say I'm traveling to Luz and I'm coming up on the intersection, but all along the way I've seen those signs that say, hey, here's the directions to the big event. Have you seen the big event? I used to drive to Chattanooga and all over the top of those barns I'd see see Ruby Falls. See y'all remember those? Are they still there? See Ruby Falls. Go to Rock City. See Rock City. And all along the way, on your way to Chattanooga, you were being inspired. Amen. To go to the big event. And that's what church is about too. It's about correction. It's about direction. 
And it's about inspiration, amen, inspiring people to go to the big event. I'm, I'm always aware that there are a lot of people who come to church and there are a lot of people who watch us online who are just curious, right? When, before I became a Christian, I was curious. I visit a lot of different churches. Methodist Church, Baptist Church, Church of Christ. Went to, Catholic, went to youth meetings at the Catholic Church. I didn't know they were going to have Mass beforehand, and I didn't know I was supposed to receive Mass because I wasn't Catholic, but I did anyway. Amen? Because I was curious. The priest was cool about it. He met me after the service out in the parking lot, and he said, you're not Catholic, are you? And I said, no, sir. He said, don't tell anybody. <laughs> He was cool about it. But part of it is inspiration. And the things that inspire us are not the things we complain about. The things you complain about, if you are constantly complaining, you're not being inspired. I was watching, uh, I watched a lot of churches during the pandemic and during quarantine. I was tuning in because we all suddenly had to become videographers we all had to get better at online worship. All of a sudden, they don't teach you that stuff in seminary, by the way. They don't teach you how to do online church. That's not, that's not a surprise to anybody, right? And so I was checking out some of these worship services, and I was going, ooh, that's really bad. <laughs> that's really bad. But there was one little church, because I knew the pastor, I kept watching, and I was just going, ooh, that's really bad. And it came down to a part in the service. I want you to listen to me. I came down to a part in the service where this little 11-year-old girl was singing a song. And I turned up the volume. And I said, praise the name of Jesus. I was inspired. In a poorly done <laughs> online worship service, I received inspiration. It wasn't the quality of the video or the audio that inspired me. It was what that young lady was projecting from her heart and sharing with anybody who was watching. And I was inspired. And so I, I started calling some of the people that I know in ministry and I started calling some of the people. You know, I was the licensing school director for this conference for six years and I made sure a lot of people got licensed. I called those guys and I said, you keep doing those terrible videos because it is your offering to God. It is a sweet savor in the nostrils of God when you're doing that. That is your offering. Keep it up. Be encouraged because the house of God is about inspiration. And we often find inspiration in places that we don't think we're going to find it. And you can't turn away the, the correction when it comes, and, and don't ignore the direction. Amen? So that's number two. And here's number three. The house of God is a commitment. Jacob, if you remember the story, stole his brother Esau's birthright. Esau was the oldest of the twins, and Esau was a big, strong, manly man, and he was a hunter. He was not just a hunter. He was an expert hunter. When Esau went out to hunt, he always bagged something. Amen? And he brought it back, and he, he cooked up that red meat stew that he liked. And Jacob tricked him into selling his birthright for a bowl of that soup. Y'all remember the story? Jacob even put animal hair on his arms so that when his blind daddy touched him he would think it was Esau so that he could receive Esau's blessing. He was a rascal. He was a thief. He was a liar. He was all of those things. And he stole the birthright and the blessing from Esau. And Esau, being the loving brother that he, did, he was, said, I'm going to kill you. This is Esau. When Esau threw a spear, he didn't miss. When Esau shot an arrow, it landed on the mark. And so Jacob's mama said, run. Run long, run hard, and run fast. And that is why he was traveling from Gardendale to Thunder Bay. Amen. 
because he was being chased by a man who was his brother who wanted him dead. And this is Jacob, the supplanter, the trickster, the guy that had messed up so many times that lay his head on that rock and had a vision of the angels of God descending and ascending on a staircase. And he said, I, I didn't know it at first, but I know now. And he made a vow unto God, I'm going to be a changed person. Because of this experience that I've had with God, a tenth of everything that I have, I'm giving to the Lord because he's looking after me. He made the vow of the tithe. You are not invested in anything until you're invested with your money. My wife took a trip to the North Georgia mountains and she went to the strip mall where there was Gucci and Prada outlets. Amen. You can walk into a Gucci and a Prada outlet and look around, but you're not committed till you get out your wallet. Amen. You can go look at those red bottom shoes, right? But you're not committed till you pull out the credit card. Some of y'all got Louis Vuitton, don't you? Anybody want to confess? You're not committed till you put your money where your mouth is. And this is hard for me to explain unless you are a tither. So you need to speak to someone who pays their 10% to God about the blessings that they, are, that they receive out of that. I, if your marriage is falling, I, I, <laughs> there are two reasons marriages fall apart. Two main reasons. There are other reasons other than two. But here are the two main reasons. Infidelity or money problems. Okay? And I had a couple come to me one time and they said, we don't have enough money to pay our bills. You know what I said? I said, start paying your tithe. And they said, preacher, you're not hearing me. I don't have any money to give to the church. I said, start paying your tithe and your money problems will go away. Nobody understands that but a tither. Your money problems go away when you pay your tenth to God. It's amazing how it works. I think I've mentioned this to you before. I pay more in taxes now than I used to, used to make in salary. But even back in the day when we didn't have any money and we were living off macaroni and cheese because it was four for a dollar, my wife said to me, we're going to remain generous even if we don't have anything. We're going to remain generous. I'm not talking about your time I'm not talking about your talents. I'm talking about your money. It became custom in Israel that they would hold a rod out over the, over the goats and the sheep when they were passing through the gate and they would count off every tenth one as holy unto the Lord and it was set aside for a sacrifice. Every tenth animal set aside for a sacrifice. It's the law of generosity. It is a spiritual law. It is sure and it is steadfast. If you're grumpy all the time, if you're argumentative all the time, if you lack direction all the time, pay your tithe. You will no longer be grumpy. You will, you will find direction. You will find inner. Uh, uh, intercessing, intercession, you will find connection. All those things we're talking about, though, you'll find all of those things if you put your money where your mouth is. Y'all look like you don't believe me. <laughs> Jacob had such an experience with God, such a connection with God, that he, he promised the tithe. Now, I'm not going to say everything is going to go well. You can turn over from this. You can turn over a few chapters and go to chapter 32. And Jacob is wrestling with God, wanting a blessing. And so you know what God does, right? He touches him in the hip and he breaks his hip and he says, there's your blessing. And Jacob, from that time on, walked with a limp because this was God's way of saying to him, I gave you what you wanted because you're not going to depend on your own wiles and your own strength and your own smarts. From now on, you got nobody to depend on but God. 
Nobody to depend on but God. Amen. Everybody say amen. It'll make you feel better about the tithing. If you say amen. It's a commitment. It's a connection. It's a correction. It's a direction. It's an inspiration. All of that. And let me tell you something, folks. You don't leave something you're committed to. You won't leave something you're committed to. <clears throat> I'm not leaving my wife after 41 years because I'm committed to her. I'm not just committed to her with my affection. Believe me when I say to you, I am committed to her with my money. <laughs> Amen? Y'all with me? And some of the women can say the same thing about their men and all their toys. Amen, women? You're committed to your husband with your money. Right? Wow, this is the house of God. It is the house of God, and I didn't even realize it. I didn't know. But that connection is there. And the angels of God are communicating with me, and they're ascending and descending on the person of Jesus Christ. And there's a connection there. So I will give a tenth of all I have to the Lord my God. Because this is the house of God. This is the house of God. This is Bethel. This is the birth of the church. It happened first in Genesis. The birth of the Christian church happens in Acts. But the birth of the house of God starts in Genesis. Aren't you glad that God reaches out to us that way? Aren't you glad that there is a connection? Aren't you glad that the angels of God ascend and descend through the power of the Holy Spirit? You know, when Jesus left, he said, Oh, you're not alone. Ladder's still there, guys. That's what he told the disciple. Ladder's still there. It's the Holy Ghost. There's still a connection. So God asked for our commitment. Let us pray. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you and we give you honor and glory. And we thank you, Lord, for the house of God. We thank you, God, for your house. We thank you, God, that you ask us to be committed. And we ask you, God, to help us be committed. Empower us to be committed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. As we all stand and, and we sing the final hymn, the altar is open for prayer. You can pray where you are or come to the altar. If you have a need to bring to the altar, now is the time to do that. <clears throat> Jacob took that, all, that, took that stone and he anointed it with oil. And he said, here is the house of God. Here is the altar of God. Let's sing.
Aren't you glad that we have the opportunity to be a part of the house of God? Amen. That we have a part of that connection in that conversation and that commitment. Thank you for your commitment. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let all of God's children say, Amen. Amen.